Today's guest once said that she appreciated the seats she's been able to sit in because it allowed her to look at community building from very different aspects. Now she's the leader of the nation's first community development corporation, the Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation. Now I've been on the board of BSRC since 1993, when I was 12, and I'm excited <laughs> as we move forward with a new leader with a fresh perspective and skill set. Blondell Pinnock is the sister making history and we are so thrilled that we're going to be able to talk to her about her journey as we navigate through her transitions. I wanted to create a safe space to have uncomfortable yet transformative conversations that move people, amplifying the voices of those who are underrepresented and who inspire positive change. I'm Tony Williams, and this is Brooklyn Savvy. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Um, you have not been at Bed-Stuy Restoration. I don't think you've been here six months yet. I, actually, today is my fifth month anniversary. So you are brand new. <laughs> so when I said fresh perspective, I know that's what you're going to bring. Absolutely. But what I first want to highlight and make really salient is the fact that you are the first female to lead this organization. Talk to us about what that feels like. You know, um, I don't think I think about it until, until people say it to me. Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, I was called to lead and to run um, a historic, you know, legendary um, community development corporation. So I'm just doing the thing that I know how to do well. Uh, which is which is to lead and to use my skill set that I've been given um, to push this organization forward. Uh, but when I sit and think about it, when I think about the history, when I think about the leadership, uh, when I think about um, Frank Thomas, I'm oh wow, iconic, the late Frank Thomas, um, iconic leader. When right. I think about mm -hmm. Colvin Granham, yes, mm -hmm. um, and Fabulous. I think about mm -hmm. the um, paths that they set. Um, you know, I, I, someone told me, you know, I'm basically swimming in their wake. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. They've helped to make some, right. they've helped to make some inroads mm -hmm. um, within this community, um, but also within the space of um, community development and economic development and community building that is critical. Now, you are no stranger to community development. Yeah. So talk to us about what you did prior to coming to Bed-Stuy Restoration mm -hmm. that really positioned you to be the leader that you are now. Sure. So uh, I started out my career as an attorney, mm -hmm. um, and I practiced law as a litigator. Right, and you uh, went to Columbia, correct? I went to Columbia right. undergrad, right. and I went yes. to Hofstra Law School. Okay, excellent. Long yes. Island. So, as a city kid, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not born in Brooklyn, I'm a Bronx kid. Okay. Um, but oh, well, you know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have everything. Like everybody, right? right. <laughs> um, no so. offense, Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, as I said, I started out as an attorney and I, I was a litigator mm -hmm. and I worked in a law firm and I really wanted to understand real estate. Uh, so I had an opportunity to work for a city agency, the Department of Housing Preservation Development. Mm -hmm. um, so I left my cushy law firm job um, and I went to go work in New York City's Department of Housing Preservation Development, or HPD, mm -hmm. as it's known. Mm -hmm. um, and that was an amazing experience because I really got to see how one could use public policy uh, to create change and to build neighborhoods. Um, and um, I stayed there for a couple of years and then I had the opportunity to go work in a bank um, starting out on the... Well, this is interesting because you're, you're seeing what community needs and how to build and now to finance it. Right, right, how to finance it. And then how it. to mm -hmm. finance it. So I became intrigued, like how do you get these big projects done? You know, how, how do you take what was um, an infill project um, and make this, you know, 30 story uh, uh, building? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to figure out how does one do that? Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to go work at a bank and be credit trained. So I was essentially starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, I started as a, an AVP and I went to, I got a, a position at Fleet Boston Financial uh, where I was credit trained. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. was taught mm -hmm. all the tools one needed to know on how to underwrite and how to understand financing, 
um, uh, developments in real estate. And so I started there and I eventually worked my way up to be senior vice president um, of in, within a commercial real estate group, but focused on community development, mm -hmm. and, um, which I loved. And I stayed there for a considerable amount of time. And then I wind up going to Carver Federal Savings Bank. Wow, and that, now that is a African-American bank, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. African-American bank, at the time it was led by an African-American woman, mm -hmm. uh, De Debbie Wright. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Who was my mentor, <laughs> and, um, and it still is. And um, it was a community-based bank, much smaller than, than, than Fleet and eventually Bank of America right. where, where uh, that wind up acquiring Fleet. But I wind up going there and it's, it, I had the opportunity to be a big fish in a very small pond. Okay, right. Um, while at Carver, um, I was able to testify in Congress mm -hmm. um, about um, you know, some of the programs that we had. I was able to really reach deep into communities. So that's how I learned about Brooklyn right. and my love for Brooklyn. Um, right. By working and being a carpenter. I, I want to go back though to the female mm -hmm. piece to mm -hmm. this. Would it? Would it? Do? You, how is being a or do you see it this way? A woman in this position an asset to you? I think. I think given where we are right now right. in society, mm -hmm. I think um, being a woman and seeing um, what women leaders are doing today. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, it empowers me and emboldens me because I'm seeing other women um, in this space, in this community, doing the things that I'm doing. Right. So I think it would have been different a few years ago um, if I had come into this role. But um, I'm looking right now at you know the head of Brooklyn Community Foundation, mm -hmm. um, Jocelyn Rainey, mm -hmm. black woman. Um, the head of BAM mm -hmm. is a black woman. Right. Uh, the head of the Brooklyn Navy Yard is a black yes. woman. Yes, Lindsay. Um, and now right. here I am, right. you know, in this role. So the fact that I can look up and see all these other amazing women in this role today just gives me um, confirmation um, and gives me comfort to know that I'm in the right space at the right And time. you have that network as mm -hmm. well. Absolutely. You know, you have that. Now, what is, you mentioned this early on and it had to do with Colvin. Mm -hmm. Now he was at restoration for 20 plus years. Now you're stepping in. Mm -hmm. Talk about transition. This is a transition mm -hmm. of leadership. How are you navigating this? Uh, so, so that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in, in navigating that, I mean, I, it's, it's important for me to understand um, the, the, the path that was taken to get the organization to where it is today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that that's an important thing. Um, it's also understanding um, the, the staff that's right. here. Right, right, because you've got um, a culture now that has pretty entrenched and embedded, right? Yes. Right, yes. right. So, so it's really getting to understand the staff that's here, um, getting to understand the, the programming, and I think more importantly, understanding the community. Uh, because the community mm -hmm. today is very, very different mm -hmm. um, than the community that was here um, 20 plus years ago. Um, and I believe that um, in taking a look at all of those factors, that it's, it's allowing me to formulate um, my, my thesis and my theory of change and ways that I can start to, to go about um, looking at our programming maybe in a different way, um, looking at the ways that we measure impact in a different way, um, and just making sure that we have the messaging and the narrative of what we are doing, and that we're able to really extend that to this community and beyond. Now, dealing with, you know, I think what I'm thinking of restoration and thinking about the way that it has done business in the past. How will you be tweaking that? And not that it was bad. Yeah. I mean, everything must change. Yeah. But what are those new things that you see yourself as being able to identify and make a market? Well, I think what's really important is the way that we communicate today. Mm -hmm. um, well, we social media is a major form of communication. Um, and where I see that restoration can have more of an impact is within a social media space. And I would love for us to be able to tell our story to a new generation. Mm -hmm. um, there are new entrants into this market um, that are new to Bed-Stuy, that are new to Brooklyn, that may not be as familiar with restoration as a lot of people. And I think it is incumbent upon us 
to make sure that our story is being told in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have the ability to use social media mm -hmm. to be able to do that right. um, in, in a very purposeful way. Uh, I think we have this amazing space here, the right. Billy Holiday Theater. Absolutely. And I would love to see um, more activities and, and more conversations, events and conversations, right. conversations being held here. Absolutely. Um, like the 92nd Street Y. Why not? I don't see why not. We're 92nd Street Y <laughs> right now. Exactly. No, but seriously. Exactly. Seriously. And, right. and I would want to see these um, thought leaders. Mm -hmm. um, I want to see um, community activists and I want to see um, people who are talking to us about um, economic mobility mm -hmm. and disrupting, disrupting the racial wealth gap. Uh, to be here on the stage um, and this audience to be full of people from this community. Now, you mentioned something that I really have to highlight, which is the fact that we're working on the racial wealth gap. Mm -hmm. The average black family has 10% the wealth of the average white family. There's a lot of streams that we're doing, you know, from workforce development mm -hmm. and helping small businesses. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the this new innovation campus mm -hmm. that that people are beginning to talk about. So, so Tony, as you know very well, mm -hmm. um, we are sitting on this campus. Uh, that it's, has, it's big when you look at it. And it that is? plaza over there. That the yes, plaza. Right. The, and, that used and to be a skating rink. It used to be a skating rink. Right. Um, but the space that we're sitting in um, is over 300,000 square feet. Wow. Um, right. And this makes up, this is the town hall. This is the center. Mm -hmm. This is the hub. The buildings are in need of repair. Um, it, and it's time. It's mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. uh, the community deserves it. Right. Right. And um, so we are... Um, embarking on creating the innovation campus and what that will consist of is the uh, reimagining and the rebuilding of this entire campus. Right. So that means tearing down what is here. Wow. <laughs> tearing down what is here and creating state-of-the-art towers that will house uh, our technology hub, that will house our cultural space, now, is there a residential component to the to the? To there is not a residential. So it's component. all going to be that the the towers are going to be about office spaces. The towers are going to be about right. office space. The towers are going to are going to be about retail. Mm -hmm. The towers are going to be about educational spaces. Uh, the towers are going to be about workforce development. Right. So that that is the goal and the intent. But we want this to be we want Bed Stuy to be the tech hub. Let's talk about how that's going to happen because it's like an ecosystem that you're trying to build right. build out. Can you talk? Can you elaborate on the tech hub piece sure. and what it's going to take to make that happen? Because I I think it should happen. It, well, I, it has to happen. Yeah, it must happen. Um, it must happen because well, what we do know is the the growth that we've seen in particularly New York in jobs have been in the tech space. Mm -hmm. And what we also know. And we're not present. Right. And what we right. also and what we also know is um, to your point mm -hmm. that we are not present. Um, in those jobs, um, and a lot of those jobs don't necessarily require a college degree. Right, and they're called new collar jobs, right. I think. Exactly. I read about blue collar exactly. and new collar, exactly. and that, it's real interesting. Exactly, yeah. but we're being left out right. once again. Um, so we started working with uh, the Marcy Lab School. Right, I was, yes. In mm -hmm. a program uh, that we called Breakthrough Technology. Right. Um, and it's actually their software engineering program. Mm -hmm. And we did a proof of concept where we took 20 young people uh, who have college degrees mm -hmm. but were underemployed. Right. And we put them through an intensive four month training. And with that four month training, plus the wraparound services that they received from restoration, um, wraparound services that focused on financial education, mm -hmm. wraparound services that focused on job coaching, and wraparound services that that took care of the social and emotional well-being mm -hmm. of that individual, we were able to get those 20, 19 of the 20 young people into jobs that paid them over $106,000 a year. Now, Brooklyn, listen to that. Right? I, I'm, that I, that's a proud, proud metric right there. That is, mm -hmm. that is. And that mm -hmm. was just, uh, you know, let's see if we can do this. Right. So now that we're able to do this, we know that we can expand this program and we can scale this program and we can have more people. And why not also expand it to, to young people who, who are in high school? Um, because we know that if we can have the hard skills training for them to get them where they need to be, mm -hmm. and then we can surround them and scaffold them with the soft skills, that we can get them into these well-paying jobs, and more importantly, keep them there, mm -hmm. um, and also help them um, scale up economically within that job. 
Um, so it's not something where you have this job, you have this placement and that's it. Mm -hmm. We're still working with those people. We're right. still working with those young people. So we're helping them, guiding them. Um, we're helping them improve their credit score. Uh, we're helping them save money. This is all life skills. All life skills, right. Exactly. And hopefully hope, we'll help them purchase their first home. Oh, wow. What a story that would be, mm -hmm. right? Now, now I want to talk about something that happened over the summer, very close to when you, I think you had been with us maybe two or three weeks, <laughs> and VP Kamala Harris comes to bed -Stuy. Yes. So know. let's talk about that <laughs> visit and then what's come out of that visit. Sure. Right. Sure. So um, I was just sitting at my desk, minding my business, and, <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> and um, get a phone call. Right saying that I will be getting a phone call from the, from, uh, the White House or from the v VP's office. And you had just started. It was like, right. what? <laughs> <laughs> um, and sure enough, I did. Mm -hmm. About five minutes later, I did get a call from the vice president's office. And they indicated that they wanted to come here to make an announcement about um, this economic opportunity coalition, which was a pr public and private partnership where they would be bringing foundations they would be bringing nonprofit organizations, um, and they would be bringing um, community development financial institutions wow. or CDFIs to the table. So they're con they, they were convening. They're essentially they're convening, to correct? Bring, and but to bring money into was it forty six? Was it forty six million? How much was it? Forty six billion that they it, that they're committed to doing so over and, what period of time? Uh, so oh, the, yeah. their period of time is it's an extended period. Okay, because yes. So, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and so they, she wanted to make the announcement here, right? Um, and she, and the reason why is because, to your point, we are the first community mm -hmm. development corporation mm -hmm. in the country. We are the first community development corporation that was formed through public-private partnership. Absolutely, right. Um, and she wanted to bring it home that this is what's needed in order to help communities. And so we, we hosted her um, as well as uh, some corporate leaders. Right. Um, and some cabinet members. Did it jumpstart anything for the community? I, I believe that it did. I okay. mean, there was definitely buzz and excitement when she came here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know I was excited. Oh, weren't we? <laughs> I, think I was we were right there. So, right, yes. Right. I think it was we like, were what? All right here. Right. We it was were wonderful. all excited. Um, but, I, but what it also allowed people to see us as a convener. Mm hmm that we're an organization that we're, we were able to bring so many people to the table, other nonprofits, um, major banks, major corporations, they were here, they were all here that day. Um, and to, to understand the power that we have and the fact that while we started in 1967, that we, we're still here right. and we are still doing what we're supposed right. to be doing in the community and that's why she, they were able to pick up a telephone and call us and we were able to make that visit happen. Well, we have been talking about restoration and, and, and it's, it's a wonderful story, but we know that there's some challenges here, you know, and I think we had a conversation and we were looking at the kind of money mm -hmm. that foundations give to black women led groups. And I think it's 0.06%. So talk about the fundraising challenges and how that impacts everything that you need to make happen, you know? Right, so, so that statistic said that less than 1% yes. of philanthropic dollars are going to organizations that are led by black women. Embarrassing. It well, is no, it's not embarrassing, it's tragic, it's, tragic. it's, it's, it's not just, it's, it's a it's, lot of other things, so, right? So, so what, that says, what that says to me um, and to, to all black women that are leading these organizations, it's that much harder for us to do the job that we need to do because the CEOs, in, addi in addition to making sure our or the organization is running the way it should run, um, our constant drumbeat is raising capital right. to ensure that that happens. Right. Um, and when I think about- And those are hard dollars to raise. Those are hard dollars to raise right. because um, you have dollars that are coming in that are used specifically for, for a program. For a program right. with a little bit of overhead. With a little bit right. of overhead that I can't use for other things. Right. Um, but raising those general operating dollars, support for the organization right. that we need to run the day to day to pay for to get. me right. and to pay for my staff. Absolutely. That's that's the hard that's the hard dollar and that's the hard nut to crack. Um, but it's critical because if we didn't have to worry about that, then think how much mm. time we could spend really 
thinking about and strategizing um, and convening with other organizations to talk about the, the true work that needs to be done on the right. ground. Right, and with, with the metric of raising the wealth gap. That is right. the metric that, right. you're, that you're looking at. Right. Because at the, at the end of the day, our focus is a social justice lens. Right. Like we are trying to ensure that um, the community that we came to see um, does not stay and rest in poverty. We're here to improve the lives of the people that are here. Um, we're able, we want to be able to close this gap, not just talk about it, not just do these one-off programs, but systemically, what are we doing to ensure that when we make these changes, that we don't go back to where we are and we're not having the same conversation and year what, after what year. And what is particularly challenging is the fact that you've got to keep Bed-Stuy restoration sustainable while raising money for an innovation campus. How the heck you gonna do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, that's a tough thing right there. I know that we will get there. Mm -hmm. um, the good thing is we have, we have so much support, um, particularly from um, our current administration, um, the, the Adams administration, um, that's supporting our efforts to, to make this project happen. Um, I believe that there's a lot of support out there um, pushing us, and I, I keep saying I have there, I have some wing, wind beneath my wings. Yes, um, that's making sure that we're going to be able to do this because we have to. Like, it's, it's not a nice to have; it's a must have. It's a must have. have. It's a must Because um, we have to be able to bring this 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 organization and bring this community to this to its next level. Now, you talked about culture being the nexus. So let's speak about the Billy, how that's going to fit into this whole innovation campus. Um, the culture and the arts and culture piece of what it is that we're doing um, is a critical part of mm -hmm. everything that, we, that we're doing. Um, because to me, what we're building doesn't exist without the arts and culture. Right. Um, the Billy Holiday itself, it's been here for 50 years. Um, so anything that we're doing that we're touching, we have to ensure that we are preserving the arts and culture of this community. And the one thing that I am realizing being here in Bed-Stuy is how rich the arts culture is here. And, and especially with this gentrification that is going on. You know, I can imagine that community members would see activity here and wonder if it's for them. Right. But it is for them. It is for them. Right. It, it's for everyone. Right. It's for everyone. I, I, I feel that um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have to leave bed -Stuy and go to Manhattan to, to see right. art. Right. Um, I shouldn't have to leave to see a wonderful play. Um, Maybe you shouldn't I, have to leave to get a job. I should, <laughs> and right, I probably right. shouldn't have to leave right. to get a job mm -hmm. either, but, mm -hmm. but it, wouldn't it be wonderful, and it should be wonderful, and it is, mm -hmm. that, we are able, that we have this gem here, and we've had it, um, where we can have um, amazing works of art. We can have amazing speakers. We mm -hmm. can have um, amazing thought leaders. We can have amazing um, dancers. At the end of the day, no matter what we're doing, understand that it is centered um, in, in African art and, and in African culture from the diaspora. Uh, but it is for everybody Absolutely. to enjoy. Absolutely. I, and I want to go back, because this is something that I've really wanted to highlight, the, the fundraising challenges. But there's even more when it comes to us, black women in these roles. Uh, how do you feel about the lack of social capital and networks? Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's real. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm gonna be honest with you um, and transparent. Um, so, so we don't have the things that we need at, at the tools that we need at our disposal. However, I do feel encouraged that these are tools that we can build. Mm -hmm. I do feel encouraged that there's um, there is new talent, and there are people that are that are reaching out to me um, about wanting to do this type of work. Uh, there are people that um, know who the history of restoration, and they want to be part of the that change in history. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited about that because there are a lot of amazing young people that are out there that want an opportunity to be at a place like restoration. And I like think their voices need to be heard Absolutely. because we, the boomers have been with this for some time <laughs> and it's time to let go and he, because each generation brings a new way of thinking and being. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. And, and whatever we're building today, we're building that for the generation to come. So they need to be participating so in this. So I feel that they need to participate in whatever it is that we're doing when we're thinking about uh, and we start, when we start to have those public interactions in those meetings about what this 
what this project needs to not only look like, but what it needs to contain as far as retail, as far as culture, as far as workforce development. We need to hear their voices. We need to hear them tell us what they want to see. Being a savvy leader. So what keeps you up at night? <laughs> I know, right? Every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but not, but right? Because you're a believer in yourself. You believe in what you can do. You believe that you can be the change, I, right? <laughs> you have to believe it. Well, I you do. Have to believe I, it. I, I, was having, <laughs> I was having a conversation with someone today. I said, I'm actually excited mm -hmm. about the challenge mm -hmm. um, because it is a challenge. Yes. Um, and someone said, someone said, I don't envy you and it's going to be hard. And I said, well, that's why I came here. Good for you. That's why I was hired. You're not afraid of hard. I'm not afraid of hard. Right. So I'm not afraid of hard. I'm not afraid of, of cracking some eggs. I'm not afraid of doing those things. Because when you do that, then you get to find out um, what things really work, mm -hmm. you know, and what things are sticking. I what like that, crack aren't. some eggs. Yeah, huh? I gotta, I gotta, hey, hey, <laughs> and build a plane while flying. <laughs> right, I, say, I have to, That's a good so one. I know that I'm gonna have to do that, but, but it's okay, right. because I think that it allows me to, to, um, to really see well, what's working here mm -hmm. um, and what's not working right. and what things can we change. Right. And, and just, I think as long as I'm transparent about that uh, with the community, uh, with our board, uh, with our staff, I do think that all these things will work together. And I love that word transparent because it's important for people to see you that way because then it moves towards your being a very trusted leader. Yeah. And typically, when your name is mentioned, you get some yays and stuff. So that means that that's, that's a core value, that people, that, that authenticity is, is really, really working for you. And I got a big grin on my face because I just like that. It, it is. Yes. That's, I mean, yes. transparency is, is definitely, um, I think, a part of, of who I am. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure that people, everyone knows and understands you know, where we're coming from and more importantly, where we're going. Absolutely. Um, and it's okay to sometimes say, hey, you know what, we may have to pivot or we may have to change and here's the reason why. Right. Um, but I think it's just important that we're just honest um, and letting people know. And getting back to the leadership style in question, talk about the importance of team as we wrap up. How mm -hmm. important is, is the team and nurturing the team and what is it that you're looking for in team? So, so team is um, the only way that I'd be able to get any of this done because mm -hmm. I, I know, if I don't know anything else, I know that I cannot do any of this by myself. Mm -hmm. um, so it's having the right people around me, um, but more importantly, having those people believe in me mm -hmm. um, and believe in my leadership um, and in my style, um, having the ability to have frank conversations, mm -hmm. Um, and you know there may be some questions. Uh, I spoke with someone today. They said, you know, I just need to learn. I just need to learn your style. I said, and mm -hmm. everybody's learning my style, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a good thing, right? right? Uh, so I believe that. But once I do that, I think, um, and we can start to work together and gel together. That's where we will start to build. It was wonderful talking to you, thank Blondell. You, Very inspiring. And I appreciate you. Oh, um, thank you. And all the work oh. that you've done and. Um, you being on the board and seeing another woman yes, um, yes. in a position of power. Absolutely. Uh, it is important for me. Absolutely. To, uh, to know that that exists. So I do appreciate you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And we will see you next time on Brooklyn Savvy. Mm -hmm.